Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Intermountain Fair Housing Council's uh, Fair Housing Training today. Uh, right now, we just um, put out a poll for you to answer to see who's in the room. My name is Zoe Ann Olson. I am the Executive Director of the Intermountain Fair Housing Council. And today um, is the second part of our Fair Housing Training Series on the Fundamental Transformation of Land Use Policies and Practices. Today is about language access compliance under the Fair Housing Act and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. I just wanna welcome everyone today. We're so grateful to have you here because that shows your commitment to fair housing and fair community, particularly for people who are most disenfranchised from our community and have been historically discriminated against, particularly people based on national origin and including people who may not have access to your wonderful um, housing provisions, land use decisions, and community housing programs. Those are people who speak more than one language. And we're really amazed at how many people can speak multiple languages and add so much to the Idaho community by giving all that they can during, especially during the pandemic with essential work, with medical care, with food provision. And so right now in our, in you being here, we're making a commitment to increasing our knowledge, to having good customer service and welcoming the experts of Gary Haynes, of Gary E. Haynes and Associates, LLC. And also with Gary Haynes, E. Haynes and Associates, LLC is Rob Christensen. Both will prevent, present information on language access compliance under the Fair Housing Act and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Thank you so much. And we'll be starting the show. Oh, before we begin, uh, looking at poll one, most people here are housing advocates and attorneys. So, um, and if you didn't get a chance to answer, please uh, follow up in the chat. Thank you so much. And Rob and Gary, it's your turn to go. Thank you, Zoanne. Well, I, I think Gary is right in the middle of some technical difficulties. So I'm going to go ahead and kick it off until we're able to get him back on board. Um, thank you. Our agenda today will include uh, what is English proficiency, uh, as well as why should I care, LEP, Title VI and Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act, meaningful access to federally assisted housing, what is language assistance, language access resources, and then finally a question and answer section. So we hope that we're able to provide you some information today. Gary and I have done this numerous times in different forums. And so we're more than happy to present, provide information, realizing of course that this limited English, English proficiency planning and language access that we're referring to is specific to housing uh, typically. And we are now, kind of broadening it to include information on accessing um, the same rights that anyone would access, whether it's land use, whether it's Section 8 housing vouchers, whatever the housing or other HUD founded uh, project or funded project that would be required to meet these obligations. So again, our um, welcoming everyone. Oh Brittany, God, if you would move on to slide number three, please. So this is not legal advice. Uh, neither Gary nor I are attorneys. And yet at the same time, we want to provide the best information we can. Should you have questions of a legal nature, of course, then we at all times would advise you to seek assistance from qualified legal representation. However, we have been experienced with interpreting what HUD has provided in terms of guidelines and helping people to put this together in a way that is relevant to what they are doing. Can we um, move on to slide number four, please? So we mentioned that uh, providing access to people in languages other than English. Uh, what are some of those languages? Of course, we show here that there are 7,000 languages, uh, at least 380 in the U.S. alone. 
9% of people in the US are limited English proficiency. That's a pretty high number, almost one out of 10. There are 90 plus languages in Idaho alone. How many people knew that? 90 plus languages used in Idaho. And about 4% of Idahoans are limited English proficiency. Some of those languages in Idaho are probably well known. Spanish first, I would say is probably our most utilized second language. German, ironically enough, has been identified in Idaho. And of course, there are indigenous languages of the people who were here before we got here. Uh, so 4% of Idahoans. Next slide, please. What is limited English proficient? Limited English proficient is a person whose primary language is not English and does not read, write, speak, or understand English very well. That would be what we would consider to be limited English proficient. So I'm gonna repeat that. Does not read, write, speak, or understand English very well. Next, please. What are protected classes underneath the Title VI and Title Act of the Civil Rights Act? Well, Title VI is the federally assisted activities those are different projects that um, are funded through federal assistance and then Title VIII, the Fair Housing Act. And those protections include race and national origin. Language would be something that we would look at underneath race and national origin. Why should I care? We've identified that there are numerous languages in Idaho already. We've already identified that of those 4% are non-English um, proficient or limited English proficient people. So why should I care? Part of the reason to care is there's a two-sided two approach to looking at why one should care about this. The first is it's a requirement under numerous programs. Obviously, in order to receive certain things, uh, it's important that providers of services meet those obligations in order to uh, receive the funding or receive the assistance, et cetera. That's the first piece. We, I would say that's what we call the stick. The stick is that if you do not meet these, you either will not receive funding or you could have your funding cut or you could find yourself in the middle of um, a fair housing case that could cost you money, cost you difficulty, cost time for your staff, et cetera. So those are the things that you should care about in terms of what are the requirements and how you need to meet them. But for me, it's a different perspective. You should care because if you're a provider of services, that is funded, whether that's housing or whether that's some um, social service program, the folks that you want to reach out to are a demographic that you may not be reaching if you're not providing services in their language. So I would encourage everyone to look at this from more of a business perspective. And I say that, um, having been abroad, having worked as a consultant with businesses who hire me to help them access international markets. Conversely, they are very, very, very interested in learning the language of business in the United States because that's a target market for them or in Europe or even in Asia. And so the lingua franca for most business outside the United States currently is English. And the clients I have in other countries, they're very excited about having, to, being able to put their marketing materials, being able to put their services, being able to put their staff in a position to access an international market through the acquisition of language. And in this case, it's English. Conversely, 
In the United States, we've identified that there are numerous non-English speakers. We've identified there are numerous languages. In Idaho alone, we've identified some of the languages. If you're a provider of services, there's a business reason why you should care. There's a fundamental reason under these policies that are established in order to meet the guidelines. In addition to that, there is a business need that is there that you could access by accessing materials, providing materials to people in languages that is their first language. And in the third part, it's the right thing to do. In order to ensure equal access, people need to be able to access that in languages that they understand. So next slide, please. And I think I'm back now. <laughs> I'm and sorry. perfect timing, Gary, because this is now, please continue on where, you're, where we're at, Gary. We're on slide number seven. All right. So um, at this point, uh, in the last slide, um, I'm, I, I wasn't here for all of it, but I think Rob probably explained that Title VI um, covers federally assisted activities and Title VIII is the Basic Fair Housing Act. And both of them have, both of them carry some responsibility for housing providers um, to address limited English proficiency. They're different. And uh, I think it's really important to understand that distinction. So the Idaho Legal Aid Services um, produced a video, a little short video, I think it's like, like six minutes long, so it's real short. I'd like to, if uh, Brittany, you could run that now, it explains Title VIII perfectly. Housing Act prohibits discrimination in housing. Don't seem to have sound, Brittany. The Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination in housing based on race, color, sex, religion, national origin, disability, and familial status. These are referred to as protected classes. Limited English proficiency is not a protected class under the Fair Housing Act. However, nearly all people with limited English proficiency come from other countries or have family members from non-English speaking countries. Because of that, housing decisions or policies related to English proficiency will be intertwined with issues of race and national origin, both of which are protected classes. Language related restrictions, such as refusing to rent to someone who cannot speak English, will violate the Fair Housing Act if they are a pretext for race or national origin discrimination. Practices that may constitute discrimination under the act include things like an advertisement that says all tenants must speak English, refusing to deal with limited English proficient tenants based on cost when the housing provider or resident can access free or low cost language assistance, and treating people differently based on their accent. Best practice for housing providers is to allow tenants time to translate documents allow tenants to bring along interpreters and do not treat tenants or applicants for housing differently based on their accent or the language they speak. If you have questions about the Fair Housing Act, you can talk to an attorney for free by calling Idaho Legal Aid at 1-844-804-0386. If you have been discriminated against, you can file a claim with the U.S. Department of Housing or by calling 
Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so um, in that little video, it explained what all housing providers should should be doing. This would include providers of assisted housing. And ooh, yeah, that's the slide, Brittany, thank you. And, and so it talked about best practices. Now, there'll be some different kind of rules, additional rules for Title VIII assisted housing. But um, that video actually is a great little presentation, a summary of what all housing providers should be thinking about when they're addressing limited English proficiency. One of the things that, that the, the guidance both from HUD and, and that video didn't was something called a limited English proficiency. Some of the cases that HUD had on uh, Title VIII language access cases where the suggestion was it's not a requirement of the guidance, but it is a suggestion in, in some of the cases that they had where they had settlement agreements that the housing provider produce a limited English proficiency plan that describes how all of their site managers, for instance, are going to address limited English proficiency. And um, Intermountain Fair, Fair Housing Council has provided a guide for that. We'll cover that at near the end of the session if we have time. And I wanted to mention that. Rob. Next, next slide, slide, please. <clears throat> so these are the two things we wanted to take a look at, looking at the difference between these. Uh, for example, if you look at on the left side, Title VIII provides equality, right? They all have the same. And yet, if you look at Title VI on the other side, then you have equity. And equity means based on what the person is dealing with at that particular moment and addressing that need to ensure that you meet them where they're at. Instead of just providing the equal, you meet them where they're at and provide them access so they have equitable, equitable and fair, equal access to opportunity. So I'm going to give a little demonstration about how this might be important. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. And I'm sorry to our interpreter. Good luck, luck trying to, uh, ASL interpreter, good luck trying to do this. Uh, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Sinasabi ko sa inyo na nandito kayo upang malaman ang mga kailangan ng makukuha kayo po ng pundo para sa gobyerno ng United States. At pag hindi ninyo naintindihan ito, hindi ninyo makuhang gusto ninyong pondo. So anybody have an idea what I just said? See, I think we have a poll on that, don't we, Brittany? <laughs> I'm I'm smiling at some of my witty colleagues who have uh, provided <laughs> some witty responses in chat. Uh, no, uh, Mr. K, it is not a recipe for lumpia. In fact, <laughs> what I said was that uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're here to discuss how you might be able to access funding through the federal government of the United States. Uh, unfortunately, if you don't know what I'm saying, then that's of little use to you. And Gary and I, we've done this for a long time, and it's just a pretty easy way to demonstrate that if you do not speak Filipino or Tagalog, as I was speaking, and I told you that you had to know that in order to access funding for the project you're working on, for the services you're providing, for the housing that you hope to develop, you would be at a distinct disadvantage. You would not have the same access to those funding that anyone who spoke Tagalog would have. And it's a pretty easy way to show that 
yes, it's important, but it's fundamental, beyond important, it's fundamental to have language assistance. Otherwise, people do not have access to the services that non, uh, that English speaking people have. So I always tell people that, yes, I speak Filipino. Yes, I'm pretty good. Uh, some have determined native fluency. But if I was doing documents, legal documents, if I was preparing something that I had to ensure I understood, I'm going to ask for that in English. If it's a contract, if it's uh, visa requirements, etc. Even though I speak Filipino, I still at the same time have a need for language assistance when I'm dealing with official documents. It's very similar. So I wanted to share that with you. No, I'm um, not preparing an ethnic dish. That's a family favorite and traffic, I'm at home. I don't plan to return to the Philippines in the near future as much as I'd like to. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope that by giving this little example, it's a simple way to show that if you do not understand the language of the program, you will not be able to access it. And that's an immediate denial of your rights that you have the right to equal to everyone else. Next slide, please. You could also mention that the um, um, Tagalog is also a fairly common language that we find in, in our markets. It's even here in the Boise area. So um, uh, anyway, now you've had the Tagalog experience from courtesy of Rob. Hey, Brittany, could you take down the poll, please? It, it is taken down, so I don't, if it's still on your end, I apologize. I Well, maybe I have to just exit. I'm sorry. That's, no, it's I okay. I put it poll. up and took it back <laughs> down, so I hope it's gone. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, Gary and I are technology uh, uh, yeah. limited proficient, so we're uh, very that's grateful why I'm to here. have Brittany on board. <laughs> the, I'm here um, for you. So Rob was talking talking about the difference between equality, and you saw in there that uh, under Title VIII, people would be treated the same, but the their experience would be much different. The little girl on one end wasn't able to see over the wall. Um, in in the case of housing the person um, would be uh, be treated equally, but their experience would be different. The in Title uh, VI, instead of equity, the way the LEP guidance from HUD describes it is something that you're trying to achieve or you should try to achieve is what's called meaningful access. And so, what is meaningful access? Well, essentially it's language assistance that results in accurate, timely and effective communication at no cost to the LEP person. And the access is not significantly restricted, delayed or inferior as compared to that of an English proficient person. So that LEP person should have the, an equivalent experience, almost the same kind of experience as an English speaking person. And I apologize for reading that, but I think it's really important. It's the core of everything else that we're going to talk about. Next slide. So a housing provider, an assisted housing provider, starts a process of providing meaningful access by developing a language assistance program. And that consists of a language needs assessment, a language access plan, training staff, monitoring for changing needs in the market or among a tenant, tenant population, evaluating those changes, and then deciding if you need to update your language access plan. Next slide, please. So I talked about the language needs assessment. What we do there is we look at limited English proficiency in the market that you're serving. We look at limited English proficiency among the beneficiaries or tenants in your project and those you co have contact with. 
we look at the importance of the need. And of course, housing is a very high importance. Without housing, people would suffer. And so this language access becomes more critical in an activity like housing than, say, for instance, in a recreational activity of some kind that's federally assisted. And then we, we try to take a look at resources available. Of course, that's budget, but it's also what are the documents out there that are already translated? And do you have bilingual or multilingual staff? Um, do you have access to language assistance tools of some kind, for instance, like a telephonic uh, language interpretation um, vendor? So we'll talk more about that. Next slide, please. So the language access plan is essentially the policies and procedures document that you're going to ask not only yourself as a housing provider, assistant housing provider, but all of your site managers to adhere to. It's going to describe what you're going to do or what they're going to do, when you or they are going to do it, and who is responsible for, for, for taking care of it. Next slide. The, um, so the language access plan, some of the things that you need to do, sorry, Gary, uh, no, let's jump right ahead. in here. Um, notify LEP persons of rights. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Some of the ways to do that and some opportunities you have that you may not have necessarily considered. Know when an interpreter is needed or not needed. Uh, the language access plan should identify a person's language, how to access interpreters, uh, how to help lim limited English proficient callers as opposed to say people phoning, I mean, uh, showing up in person, identify documents to translate into which languages uh, by determining through Safe Harbor and Gary will talk more about what Safe Harbor is, quality control, on the services you're providing. Uh, I remember we had a sign out in NAMP at one of our Head Start schools and it said, do not leave your engine running. And the interpretation literally was running as opposed to um, being turned on. And so sometimes your quality control for how you do interpretations or translations is important to ensure that you're meeting what you've established as your guidelines within your limited access, uh, language access plan, dealing with letters and emails, and then uh, address marketing and affirmative fair housing marketing planning. The most important thing here is that it's important to designate an LEP coordinator. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Next slide, please. Now that LEP coordinator is actually not a requirement of the uh, of the HUD LEP guidance, but in almost every case that I've looked at where there's a settlement agreement, uh, HUD requires the designation of an LEP coordinator because clearly there's been a lack of communication or something like that. So that's a really important um, step to take and it's better to take it mm -hmm. as a preventative measure than one that you're responding, when you're responding to a HUD, HUD compliance review of some kind. So there are two kinds of language assistance, uh, interpretation and translation, and these terms are intermingled very often, uh, and a lot of times folks use them interchangeably. But we want to make the distinction that interpretation is listening to something in one language and then orally converting it to another, spoken language. Translation is the replacement of written text from one language into an equivalent written text into another language. So there are different ways to look at that um, regarding interpretation translation and occasionally there's crossover. There have been numerous times where I as an interpreter have had a document that I've had to read and then interpret that into oral conversation for my client and then in turn, they would respond with the answer and we would assist in writing down the uh, translated version of their original language. So there is crossover between them, but it's important to note that an interpreter is someone who does spoken or in this 
with our ASL interpreters with um, using their hands, whereas translation is the written text from one language to another language. Next slide, please. The um, important part of that is that the requirements are also different in the HUD guidance for interpretation and translation. And we'll talk about that in a moment too. The, re the character of that language assistance, whether it's interpretation or translation, there are three characteristics of it that are really important to understand. And that's that it has to be what they call competent, has to be timely, Remember, you're, this person, this LEP person is supposed to have essentially the same kind of experience as a, an English speaker, and it has to be free to that LEP person. Next slide. So competent language assistance, interpretation, qualified interpreter, certified interpreter, uh, briefed on the terminology to be used. I can... I can tell you on different occasions, I've been in circumstances where I've been the recipient of services and the interpreter was not very good. A very basic word, um, medical word, the interpreter did not know. They were good at interpreting, but they were not necessarily so good at the terminology of the language. So. In determining certified, there is a process, of course, that the courts use or other um, processes to determine certification. At the same time, qualified interpreter may not necessarily be certified or certified may not necessarily be that qualified. There have been times where languages are the same, but cultural differences make an entire conversation uh, almost unintelligible to the person who is on the receiving end of interpretation. So it's a, it's a, it's a fine line. Uh, sometimes we have to consider that best efforts are what we can do. Not always is the someone going to be from the same culture. They might be the same language group. Sometimes they might be from the same culture, but similar language group. Uh, we do the best we can to ensure that we are providing the best services. There are differences that you as a provider want to ensure based on the importance of what's being interpreted. We've talked about on numerous occasions, interpreting something that might be an invitation to a potluck, the requirement for interpretation and the, the ability of the interpreter or translation on the legal document is gonna be much different than a notice for something of a community event. Qualified translator, use plain, use plain English in your original document. And the four eye rule is to have four sets of eyes taking a look at it. I know that when I do Tagalog in translation, I typically have more than four eyes because I'm not as good in translating Tagalog as I am interpreting. And I want to ensure that I'm providing that opportunity that not only do I know what I'm writing is correct, not only have I not missed a few words here or there, just thinking I wrote them down and as I've written them, reading them in my head, miss a word or two as we do in all languages, but also then to ensure that there's some sort of uh, cultural context that I may not have missed. So, to have additional eyes is just one more way to make sure that you're providing the best service. Gary, is there anything you'd like to add on to that? Yeah, um, on the translation, um, typically a housing provider should ask a, a translator what, how they provide quality control of their documents. And typically um, what the response should be is there's at least one other person looking at that document before it comes back to you in a translated form. On the uh, qualified interpreter, um, that one's a little bit more difficult. It should be that you're dealing with an interpreter that understands the terminology that a housing provider deals with. And you can improve the quality of that interpretation by having a conversation beforehand with the interpreter about specific terms that you're going to be using so that interpreter has a chance to kind of prepare how they're going to address that. What you, you may use one or two words describing a technical term in the lease, 
because somebody has violated the lease and, and violated that term of the lease. And um, the interpreter may have, may take several words for them to explain what it is. Just think about somebody that um, in a medical setting, uh, a, a doctor trying to explain that they have uh, cancer of the gallbladder. And that person doesn't even know what a gallbladder is, let alone what cancer is and the implications of that. So it sometimes takes more time. So be prepared for that. Next slide. So this is something that is not really covered in the HUD LEP guidance. And it's something that I've, I've uh, been trying to introduce into my conversation with my clients about language assistance. And there's really a spectrum and it runs all the way from the onsite manager is going to have social interactions with uh, a person whether that's a tenant or an applicant or whatever, all the way up to a critical interaction that is going to determine whether that person is going to be housed or not housed, or they're going to lose their housing. And along with that, there's no impact, lower impact or higher impact. And for the housing provider, they need to understand that there's commensurate with that is there's lower risk in the case of a social interaction or or in the case of a low impact interaction of some kind versus high risk when say you're talking about a lease violation. And so it requires a housing provider to think a little bit about how they're providing language assistance appropriately. So you're reducing your risk, you're increasing the quality, improving the quality of that communication at the same time as the impact becomes greater. Next slide. So, oops, oops, back one slide, please. So uh, we talked about um, uh, the two, two kinds of language um, uh, assistance are really interpretation and translation. Now, we gesture, I gesture, um, some of us speak louder and slower, and some of us might consider using a child to interpret. Now, here's the thing. If you're dealing with a situation that's a social conversation of some kind, those are not covered by the HUD LEP guidance for, assistant, for an assisted housing provider. But they're, and so, they're okay. These are bad practices for anything above that, above a social interaction. The only, um, uh, we'll talk about an exception to that, but um, these are not language assistance, not considered language assistance. And I also tell you that a child interpreting is considered really bad practice. It's one of the things that in the HUD LEP guidance, it discourages it, but I'm gonna tell you when you might wanna consider using it. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is it. So we talked about those low impact events, social kinds of interactions. So you wanna talk about the weather, the soccer, but you may also have an emergency of some kind on site where you need an interpreter, you may have to ask a child to interpret, to, to get an immediate answer of some kind. Again, it's not a good practice. If you have any alternative at all, use it. Next slide. I guarantee you that if you ask a parent, were you aware that your son or daughter broke the window and the son or daughters during the interpreting, there may be some uh, ideas about how to interpret that correctly for mom or dad. <laughs> That's true. And so we all know about Google Translate, I hope. I think it's a valuable tool. I think it provides, it broadens your opportunity to have a 
low impact or no impact kind of conversation or interaction with one of your tenants or an applicant. It's, and HUD even says that you can use these, what uh, HUD calls um, language interpretation apps uh, um, for simple things. We provide housing, park here, those kinds of things. Discourage, I would discourage you from using it for any higher level conversation with an LEP person. Uh, you also see friends and family on here. That's a cautionary note that should go along with that too. Um, generally, that's okay. I'm going to guess that in probably 80% of the cases, most of the interpretation is done by friends or family mem members on site. But there are times when a tenant, and you become accustomed to that as a housing provider, and then the tenant the same tenant comes in and says, I, I, you need to get an interpreter and you're unscrambling trying to figure out how to find an interpreter. For instance, that tenant may, there may be something that tenant doesn't want that interpreter that's always interpreted for them, that family member, to know that there's a problem. And, um, and there's sensitive issues around that. You, on the other hand, does it, especially when it gets towards a higher impact incident of some kind, you want to make sure that whoever that friend or family member is understands what they're saying, that that is a qualified interpreter. If not, what you may want to do is have your own, own interpreter that you're pretty sure is qualified. And there are vendors that can provide qualified interpreters. Next slide, please. So this is kind of the sweet spot here. Um, qualified interpreter, friends and family member that are, um, so this can cover a wide range of access to assisted housing using these kinds of interpreters and translators. Next slide. Now, if you're talking about a lease violation or an income recertification um, where the person, be, whether that person uh, is going to be able to continue to be housed or not, then it gets to be a higher risk, higher impact kind of situation. I'm going to say there that you need to think about definitely a qualified interpreter or translator in those cases. As I mentioned, while I might be comfortable speaking Filipino in almost all scenarios, when it comes to legal documents, something of the higher risk, I want that in English, which is my first language. And I think you can understand Conversely, for those people whose English is not their first language, while they might even be pretty good in speaking English, understanding English, there's a different, different obligation when it comes to something that has a greater impact that could adversely impact them. So we want to ensure that we're looking at that and considering that when determining the qualifications or the ability of your interpreter or translator. And um, next slide. So in court, you're gonna be dealing with a certified interpreter or translator, they're court certified. But if, and then there are some like uh, public housing authorities, for instance, have some hearing uh, requirements that they go through. You might wanna consider a certified interpreter in that case. Next slide. Hmm. Um, your website is a portal to your housing. Oftentimes, many housing providers put the application on their website. Um, so here's the thing about that. Typically, you see these tools where you click and it'll translate um, text on a website. And that's a good thing up to a point. Um, the problem with Google Translate is, and they even say the, this themselves, that it does not provide competent interpretation or competent translation of la one language into another language. The other, th another thing about it is that it's not confidential. Uh, uh, Google Translate, Google actually reviews uh, uh, transactions on on Google Translate, and they in an effort to try to improve that algorithm. And it's getting good, but it's still not good enough and it's still not confidential. So you need to be aware of that. 
So it's, there's some real limitations there. On the other hand, it can provide your website in a, multiple languages. I would suggest if you're putting the application on your website that you need to think about, at least in the major language or languages, you need to have a qualified translation of that, a competent translation of that document there for their use. At least somebody, you may have it in Spanish translated, but at least somebody in Tagalog could access it and understand partially what it is. I mean, it's not a perfect thing. It should be looked at as an interim solution. So in this case, you're really looking at uh, using a uh, kind of a high risk solution for a, <laughs> a really important thing here, but in cost would restrict you on this. You just, I, have, I work with clients in some markets, they may have 20 languages that are hitting thresholds where they have to translate. You, just from a budget standpoint, it's too impact, impactful. And you could not print, if you're, you have a vacancy, you could not put that in the newspaper in 20 languages. Next slide. Is this me or you, Rob? Uh, either one of us, but I think you. <laughs> okay. Um, so in the case of interpretation, this is the oral conversion of one language into a meaningful um, um, version in another language. There is no safe harbor. If, if you're approached by an LEP person and you're an assisted housing provider, you have to provide interpretation. And again, it has to be uh, competent, timely, and free. Translation, there is what they call a safe harbor. And if you'd hit the slide, next slide, please. Yeah. So I'm just going to show this to you. I'm not going to try to explain it, but there are some thresholds that you hit. And HUD says if you're providing written language assistance within those thresholds, you're considered to be performing in an acceptable way based on the HUD LEP guidance. It, um, anyway, um, we could take a half an hour on this slide by itself. So I'm, I don't want to do that. Next slide, please. So uh, the, the language system, assistance has to be competent. And there are these safe harbors for written assistance. And just to remember that this safe harbor is a minimum performance level and it's not considered best practice. And if somebody needs a document interpreted because it isn't translated, then you are to, um, to interpret it. And I mentioned the cost burden, uh, the translation of documents is not to be so burdensome as to defeat the leg legitimate objectives of a, a program. And I think that you can see in a market with 20 languages in it, it, it becomes a really steep mountain for a housing provider to climb. But they would still have to bear the cost of interpreting that document in virtually any language. Next slide. kind of documents that, um, let's see, is this your slide, Rob? Your this mind? is yours, I've got the next one. So. Oh, okay. Uh, the, um, the kinds of documents that are subject to the translation requirements of the HUD LEP guidance are what are called vital documents. And these are those documents that are critical to accessing these federal assisted activities, including federally assisted housing. And just to remember, you always have to interpret any untranslated documents. Next slide. See, this one is you. So Rob. this would be mine and I'm back. Sorry, I had a little techno technical difficulty. So some, some of the vital documents 
why would these be considered vital? We'll talk about, but marketing information, when you're marketing, of course, you want to ensure that you're providing equal access. So starting from the very beginning, those folks that you are advertising to, that you're providing information to, if you are providing services in a community, then you have an obligation, of course, to provide those to everyone equally in that community. Through use of fair housing posters, non-discrimination posters, two posters that are advising people of rights that belong to them. If they're in a language they don't understand, you've not provided them any information whatsoever. Obviously your application should be in languages that are within the threshold, but again, as Gary said, within the best practices. While Spanish may not, let's say, be a threshold language, at the same time, it's a recurring market that you want to reach, or it's a group of people that are utilizing your services. While they may not hit that threshold number, it may be of your best interest and certainly their best interest to have those applications in the language or, or some sort of available system to, to provide the information in a language that's of their primary use. Tenant selection criteria, building system shutdown. So that's something that's pretty important if you're going to lose power um, during a period of time, then that's a pretty important thing that people need to be made aware of in a language that they can understand. Income, recertification notices, house rules, lease violations, all of these sort of documents that have an important impact and especially could have an adverse impact on people and their rights should be provided in languages that they are competent, I mean, they're comfortable to, under, to read and understand through the use of competent translations. Next slide, please. Um, we talked about internet go. translation apps, Google Translate. And um, I think I covered this already. And I, the one possible exception for the use of these is the, uh, is the websites. Internet uh, translation apps are not Oh, not are not of the best practice. They're not competent, and they're certainly not confidential. Once you've dated, entered information into the system, then you can. I'm having some difficulties with my computer here. We're hearing you fine, Rob. Okay, great. I think uh, I will just turn off video for the moment. Uh, they are not competent and they shouldn't be considered as confidential. You've entered information into the system uh, and then it's being interpreted outside of your own, your own computer. Then clearly the possibility for someone to gain access is there. And they should only be used for the simplest, simplest um, kinds of documents that need to be interpreted. I'm going to have to log out and log back on my computers, giving me difficulties. Okay. My apologies. So next slide, please. Um, well, let's see, we talked about the website. I think we'll just skip this slide. So language access tools. Um, let's see, I think this is, um, these are some of the these are some of the tools, and I think we're we're going to be able to go to the um, at a little later here. Go to the Intermountain Fair Housing Council website, and we'll look at some of these. SocialServe.com is a service that is provided by and paid for by Idaho Housing and Finance Association, and it uh, allows a housing provider. Now this is assisted housing or non-assisted housing to input information at no cost and to market their vacant units or their property. Um, and, it's all, and it provides 
Um, it has a socialcert.com has a, a translation tool on it, Google Translate, but it provides a translation of that information in multiple languages. So again, this is not a foolproof uh, answer to affirmative fair housing marketing in other languages, but it's a partial solution. So it's something that I, I suggest that housing providers, assisted and non-assisted, definitely consider. First of all, it's free. And secondly, it accomplishes at least part of your, um, addresses at least part of a, an assisted housing provider's obligation. There should be a, every in every office um, at your front desk, there should be a language identification poster or an I speak card. Uh, typically the telephonic language interpretation vendors will provide these uh, cards to their clients. Um, the written offer to interpret, and we'll show you what that is in just a moment, is probably one of the most powerful documents that you can have in your, um, uh, that you can use as a, an assisted housing provider. The Department of Justice publishes a Know Your Rights um, pamphlet that's really good. We'll show you how to find that. The telephonic language interpretation vendor is something that frankly, every assisted housing provider should provide their site manager with. There are generally two kinds of options in, in paying for that. One is kind of a um, retainer kind of arrangement and you pay a monthly fee and then um, there is a higher or, or lower, it allows a lower per minute rate on for the interpretation. The other one is a pay as you go or pay by use option with a little higher per minute rate. So, but you don't get charged if you don't use it, you don't have a need for it, but you always have it. So, and you can help people in something like 200 languages. So you should never be intimidated by an LEP person speaking a language that you're not quite sure of. Um, you would have language assistance available. The please repair document is something that's handy. Uh, we'll, we'll, it's just a, 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 an LEP person can point at an issue within their unit rather than having you to pay for an, an interpreter for them to explain to you what's wrong with the unit and it's just a, a minor thing, a minor repair or something that's understandable. And the please repair doc document can be a good tool for that, as is a welcome to your new home. The dual handset phone, there's a, a little picture of one there, that allows in a uh, more confidential uh, connection between you, the interpreter, and your client. Um, and uh, it also has a volume control, so if somebody is hearing impaired, that they can, they, you can, um, turn up the volume for them. Uh, anyway, it's not a requirement, but it's one of those tools that might help you in providing that language access that you're uh, on, on site. Next slide. So the unwritten rule about all this federal stuff is to document, document, document. So what do you want to document? Well, first of all, you want that language needs assessment, the language access plan. Then you want to document your progress against the different milestones that you've established in your language access plan. And when you have an encounter with an LEP person, you want to document what that person's language is, the duration, um, what it costs you for the interpreter. And there's a reason for that. If you are an interpreting, an uh, interpreting a document or having a document interpreted, time and time again, you're running up your interpretation costs of a document that maybe you could reduce your interpretation costs if you simply translated it. You'd shorten that in the in duration and the cost of that interpretation. And it also helps you in that planning to know whether you really need to update your language access plan. And here's the other thing. It takes HUD a few months from the time a complaint is filed until you may hear about it. And so if you lack that documentation, you're going to not have the defenses that you may need to, um, to 
as a housing provider to respond to that. Uh, next slide, Rob. Training, training, training. Uh, we talk about, and Gary talks about how when federal dollars touch a project, how they go out across the organization in terms of meeting the requirements for limited English proficiency. And he does a much better job than I do. But what I would remind people is that your staff, if you're a provider of services, your staff, whether they're frontline, that might be someone who's coming in to take a look at a fire extinguisher to ensure that it's up to date, or it might be someone who's doing your documentation for limited English proficiency. Everyone along that way has an obligation to ensure that they are meeting the guidelines. Where they are, depending on the risk, if it's someone who's talking about some recreational activities in the common area, that's one thing. If it's someone talking about you know, very uh, dangerous circumstances with electrical wiring that has to be addressed in an apartment or someone losing their section eight voucher or something, as I mentioned, an adverse impact across those lines depends on what they're doing and what the impact is to the person receiving services on what their obligation is. But everyone within the organization has an obligation to be aware of this. And then that's where training comes in. The LEP coordinator will have to determine each of the individual organization's needs based on what is happening on that scale that Gary used in the earlier slide from high risk to low risk, competent to certified, and determine how much training is provided. But it's really critical. Recently, I was at a organization and one of the vendors came in and made a disparaging comment. Uh, and yet the owner of the property didn't understand that their staff who heard that and let that comment go um, has an obligation to make sure that they are meeting these guidelines. And that doesn't matter if it's staff on the front lines, staff in the office or staff that's doing the actual documentation. Training is the most important piece because someone who has a small role in your organization that you might consider is not as vital might be someone that causes you many difficulties because they engaged in practices that violated someone's rights to equal access under these Title VI and Title VIII that we're talking about. It's imperative that you have a plan, that you establish a coordinator, that you have a training plan and you put that training in place and then you continue to monitor that to ensure that either new staff coming on board are getting training, that staff that have been trained are getting updated training, or that staff that are trained already are following the training that they've been provided. Training is really the key where your staff will take a hold of this information and use it to protect you and to protect the rights, more importantly, of the people that you hope to serve. Next slide. I deal with clients, uh, housing providers, um, all, all over the country. And training is probably the most often overlooked um, aspect of the language, uh, providing uh, a language assistance, uh, delivering language assistance to, to the limited English proficient person. I mean, they lack the training, so they don't know what they're to do. Also, there's a high turnover uh, among um, site managers and so forth. And you're always having a constantly thinking about training that new person that's in there on many things, but also including language access. The um, a little word about for housing providers about language access plan and affirmative fair housing marketing plan. They inform one another. For instance, the affirmative fair housing marketing plan essentially looks at the, uh, to see if the ethnic and racial def demographics within a uh, tenant population are similar to those in the market. Uh, that's a simplification of it, but that's part of what it looks at. The language access plan looks at those languages that are hit, hitting certain thresholds where you would want to translate your marketing information and into which languages you'd want to translate it into. 
And so you may see among your tenant population that you're, you're low in Asian Pacific Islanders, the language access plan looks at that market and should be able to tell you that you have Tagalog, Chinese, um, some other Asian Pacific languages in that tenant population. That gives you some clue about what your, your marketing information should be in as, too, to meet your obligations under the Affirmative Fair Housing Marketing Plan. Next slide. So there are really great resources at, at these agencies. So the Idaho Fair Housing Forum, um, we don't have, haven't provided you a link. Maybe we can in the chat um, provide the link. Um, HUD has a, uh, great information, as does USDA. USDA has some of the best stuff out there on language access. Um, and the US Department of Justice uh, LEP.gov website has a ton of information for you there. What I wanted to do today is touch on the Intermountain Fair Housing Council's language access guide. So Brittany, can we go to that? Maybe not. <laughs> oh yeah, here we go. Okay. Um, so Brittany, do you want to click on the, um, there's a nice opening statement here. And uh, just so Rob and I won't forget, I want to, um, the quote there, good customer service is welcome in any language. And that applies both to Title VI as well as Title VIII. And that's courtesy of Eric Kingston over at Idaho Housing and Finance Association. Both Rob and I are very complimentary of this, um, what this statement means. And we think that, frankly, that's the place to any housing provider should start with how they're approaching language access for their client, potential clients. So mm -hmm. is there any chance that you could go up and click on the language access guide? So there's a drop down menu. There are several things in here that, um, um, let's start at the very first one there at the top, uh, table of contents. So here you can see that there's information about Title VI. We talked about the, um, uh, the different federal agencies guidance and so forth. There, we've tried, uh, it has some information there. There's some information about language identification tools that we talked about. The notice of non-discrimination. Um, that is probably one of the things that often gets forgotten by the housing providers. Um, the obligation un stated under the HUD LEP guidance is that you're supposed to instruct an LEP person on their rights to language access, as well as their right to file a complaint and how to do that. And so I think it's in six languages, the notice of non-discrimination. So that's available for you to use and it's a matter of just filling in the blanks. And you can, um, anyway, it should be a helpful document. The um, uh, fair housing poster is in multiple languages. So it's in more than just English and Spanish. So in markets where you need it in other languages, where you're hitting certain thresholds, use it in those other languages. The offer to interpret, can you uh, take us to the offer interpret? Offer to interpret? So as we're scrolling down there, you can see certain things. Now here's the offer to interpret. And this is a very simple thing that you can, uh, and in some cases, remember that chart that I showed you, you're supposed to provide that, what's called a translated written notice of offer to uh, interpret a document that's not translated. So in the bolder text there, it actually, this is what the offer to, inter to interpret says. This is an important document. Do you need an interpreter? 
We can provide free interpreter services to help you understand this document. Please tell us if you need an interpreter. So it's fairly simple. It can be used when it's not required, but it also can be used when it is required. It can be used as an interim step while you're for documents that are supposed to be translated but are not yet translated. And Intermountain for Housing Council provides it in, I think it's, well, it's 40 plus languages. So anyway, a very powerful document. I'm hoping people will find their way to this and use it. Let's see, what else do we have on this? Um, is there anything else on this page? Um, I think that kind of covers it. A ton of information here. Can we go to Title VIII? So there's the video that uh, we showed, showed earlier in our presentation. So it's available for you and your staff. Um, Again, here's the HUD LEP guidance. Now, we talked about the limited English proficiency plan. Um, there, there's a place there where you can click the template. I think it brings up a, a, a there you go. So there's a template that you can use. And, and it's a matter of filling in the blanks, modifying it as you need. Um, anyway, it's again, a hopefully be a useful document for those housing providers that are, are providers of non-assisted housing. And there's additional information there. Let's see, can you go back to the agenda or the um, uh, table of contents again? Let's, let's go down to cases, LEP cases. So here's some cases uh, are, are, that were, I think they're all HUD cases on language access. I mentioned the um, this second one here, the four Massachusetts Housing Authority, authorities. That's the case that talks about the um, uh, internet translation <laughs> uh, to, yeah. And, and it will explain it. It's worth reading. Uh, there's a little bit of a summary here. But you can see that there's some money attached to that. And if you scroll down, the important thing is, I think, take a look at these, but also notice that there's a dollar sign attached to every one of them. So when I think of doing language assistance planning, I think of it as a risk management from a, from a housing provider standpoint. I think of it as a risk management step that you need to take. And the tools that are provided here, the information that's provided really takes you a long way towards um, doing a better job in risk management and also providing that meaningful access that, which is in the assistant housing um, that you're trying to accomplish and that equal, um, the, the uh, equal access in unassisted housing. So Rob, did you want to add anything to that? I do. I would just say that, you know, what what we identified the quote, good customer service in any language is welcome in any language. These presentations we do typically focus on the stick side. These are the requirements. These are the possible negative outcomes if you don't meet them. I kind of prefer to look at it from the other perspective. Mm -hmm. We are well aware that there are corporations across the globe that spend thousands of thousands, if not millions of dollars on providing marketing material in other languages. From a business perspective, yes, it's A, it's the right thing to do to provide equal access. B, it's a requirement of the programs that you're receiving funding for, or you hope to receive funding for, or participate in. But more importantly, from my perspective, it's a good business decision to provide these services in languages to markets that you may not have access to. And Coca-Cola, Nike, McDonald's spend a lot of money in foreign language advertising to ensure that they're meeting that market. 
So for those folks who think about the costs associated or may, may say, well, I don't have time for this and maybe see it as just a burdensome obligation put upon them, I always encourage them to look at it from a different perspective. When you're making yourself available to a group of people that speak a different language, you've just increased the potential for your sales, for participation, for assistance, for partnership and cooperation. I, I always encourage folks to look at it from the perspective of not we have to do this, but we can do this. This is something that will help us. Not that we have to do this to keep ourselves from getting slapped on the wrist or in a precarious circumstance. But more importantly, if we do these, some of the positive outcomes are, we reach a market that we may not have had before. We're identifying people inside of our organization that have skill sets, whether that be language or whether that be interpreting, translating, et cetera. And at the same time, we're providing the same access to our services to everyone, which is fundamentally the right thing to do. I'm also noticing on that language access guide there on that page, um, the, some of those uh, tools, there's a link there to them as well, right there. Yeah, I forgot to mention those. So um, anyway, helpful. And those, those tools will be very valuable to you as you're putting together your uh, limited English proficiency language access plan. The, yes. 15 years ago, when uh, these guidelines first came out, none of this was really available. And over the last several years, materials that have become available are now out there for anyone to use much easier. Um, and I would encourage everyone to take advantage of these tools. It will save you a lot of difficulty in creating the plan to ensure the services are met. And I think we're ready for the next slide. So there it is. The most powerful language access tool is you. Whether you are the person who is helping to determine who needs assistance in a different language, whether you are the person providing that assistance, or whether you are the person who's receiving it, critical piece is you. We need the participation of folks that are involved in this in order to ensure that services are provided. Gary? Yeah, I think um, uh, broadly on this one too is a housing provider, especially an assisted housing provider, has a, is supposed to do a for fair housing marketing planning. And under the HUD LEP guidance, they're also supposed to reach out to the community and find out what the language needs are in that community and connect with organizations that are connected with people in those languages. Um, and so the consumer is really, and the advocates out there are really important piece to this. I think that's a really important thing to mention. And then next slide, I guess. And I think we're into Q and A. Awesome, thank you so much. I have a few questions for you. And if anyone else has questions, please put them in the chat um, and we'll get to as many as we can. We were sent a question ahead of time. Let me pull it up here. All right, many HUD projects are really mixed income and not all tenants will be federally assisted or in units that are for federally assisted housing. So then how is a landlord supposed to address language assistance when they may or may not know if the tenant is living in an assisted or non-assisted unit? Well, um, I can take that one, Rob, or at least part of it. Um, HUD doesn't directly address that in any of its LEP guidance, um, which is kind of interesting because so many of the projects now are mixed income. There are assisted and non-assisted units in the property. And just what is a landlord, a housing provider supposed to do? There is a provision in the LEP guidance uh, under coverage, and it talks about this, and it says, and Rob mentioned it earlier, that if that federal dollar touches you in one place, it touches you everywhere. Um, 
I think that is particularly true in a mixed income housing project. I, I, since there's no information to the contrary, I advise my clients that they should um, look at it exactly that way. They shouldn't try to <laughs> figure out too much about who that person is and whether they're assisted or non-assisted or whether they're applying for assisted housing or non-assisted housing. That in itself could precipitate a complaint, just the delay in trying to, <laughs> to sort that out. Um, but I understand, um, and I wish we had better guidance from HUD, but we don't. So I would give a conservative interpretation of that. And I have two clients, both of which have said their entire inventory, they're going to manage the same way. They're going to provide, they're leaning into it and they're providing full language access, whether it's an assisted housing project or a non-assisted non housing project. Everybody is treated the same. So they have gone even a step above trying to, to differentiate in a mixed income project is who's who and who's assisted and who isn't assisted. So I think that that's a good approach. It's probably where HUD would like housing providers to be. There's a cost uh, attached to that, of course, and, um, and there can be a cost for not doing it as well, as we showed you in those complaints. Thank you. Um, and Dustin commented, typically, if any units are assisted, the rules apply to all units. And I would think that question, would be true. We have a question for Gary and Rob. What safe harbors may recipients follow to ensure they have no compliance finding with the Title VI LEP obligations? Hmm. Well, <laughs> the first step, of course, is to have that plan and the language and the language needs assessment that underpins it. And in that language access plan, it should should describe for you, the housing provider, what documents are to be translated. It, it, the language access plan or the way I do it doesn't give you a deadline. It allows you to set the time frame for it, translating documents. In other words, you may have to translate documents, all, all your vital documents into three languages, say. Well, that's an expensive undertaking. You're not going to be able to do it all at once or um, unlikely that you would be able to. So what you want to do is, and what HUD's expectation is that you're demonstrating progress against the goal to have all of these documents translated into all of the appropriate languages. And again, you're translating vital documents. I hope that I hope that answers the question. There's not an easy easy answer to that. Each each one of these language access plans is tailored on a project by project basis. Okay. Um, would you advise against people or potential tenants bringing their own translators or interpretation services in favor of landlords or housing providers using their own? What, have you seen conflict there? Do you want to get that one, Rob? I think you have Yes, an yes, I would. I'd be happy to, Gary. <clears throat> of course, a participant in any program has the right to bring the interpreter of their choice. Okay. That, that's their right. But where the issue comes into play is you as the provider of services ensuring that you are providing qualified access in a language that is familiar to them. While the interpreter they bring may be of their choice, we don't know to what degree they're qualified to discuss legal issues. We don't know to what degree they might be qualified to discuss medical issues. We, I would always encourage the provider to ensure that they have competent services available for themselves to protect themselves in these kind of circumstances that we're looking worst case scenarios, but more importantly, to ensure that they're providing the right information, qualified interpreters provide the right information to the clients that deserve them. Yesterday, I was with a client who um, has hearing loss as well as not English as a first language. 
And in order to understand me, that person looks me in the face and can read my lips in the language of their primary language. With a interpreter who is over the telephone or through Zoom, that doesn't necessarily work. And so each circumstance is different. I would always advise the provider of services to make sure they have competent services available. If someone wants to bring their own, that's of course, we want to respect their right to do that. Well, I think the other thing that's important to understand in the case of a, uh, an assistant housing provider, the obligation for competent interpretation and translation is your obligation, not the, the tenant's. Right. And so that means if you permit that um, uh, family member or friend to interpret, you're kind of subjected to the quality of interpretation or translation that person might provide. So remember those risk management things that we talked about is how much do you want to put yourself in somebody else's hands? Um, the other thing that Rob mentioned there is uh, a telephonic interpretation, but, uh, and I forgot to mention this earlier, we see changes in this. I've been doing this for 10 years now and I've seen multiple changes. One of the things that happened in the medical field was that instead of having uh, an in-person interpreter, which you didn't sometimes want another person in the room because of COVID for the last two years, it became, well, it first moved to telephonic uh, uh, interpretation. And now it's, uh, the way I understand it, almost all of the healthcare providers do what they call um, video in uh, uh, video remote interpretation, VRI. So my guess is over time that some of that is going to filter into other sectors like housing because there are some languages that are dependent on gesturing and hand movements and other kinds of uh, cues to understand what's being the verbal um, communication. Okay. All right, the next question is, are housing providers allowed to ask individuals or families if they are LEP? Um, I, uh, um, yes, I think is the answer to that. It probably become apparent at some point and Rob, uh, do you want to fill in that? I think my point, my piece on that was, is you ask everybody that. Yeah. Okay. You don't try to determine who may or may not be because then you're going to find yourself in some serious situations based upon appearance, based upon suspicion of origin, etc. If you put on your documents, if you put on your paperwork, if you put out front, up front that we provide services in languages other than English, please let us know if you need assistance. Then people will get the opportunity to provide self-disclose that and you're not asking them. You're providing the opportunity for them to self-disclose so that you can better provide them services. I think that would be the approach that I would always recommend. Treat everybody the same, whether they're LEP, non-LEP, just have that in your practices that the information is available in your lobby, on your paperwork, your advertising, all of the above, that you provide services in languages other than English for those who require it, it's available, and then folks can self-identify. We in the past uh, in different organizations have asked people if there's a, if they have a preferred language that they, that's another way that we phrase that so that people can self-identify. I can understand the question because are you then sort of preempting someone based upon national origin if you ask that question? So I, I understand why the question comes up. For me, the proactive approach is the better approach. Yeah, and I think asking them if they're limited English proficient is probably the wrong way to cast the question. It's, uh, do you have a preferred language is probably a better way. Or do you need assistance in another language? Something yeah. to that effect. Yes. Okay, so as we are talking about increasing language access and when you're creating um, language access plans, 
Um, I know that some of this gets into the work that you do outside, but um, how do you advise start just from a starting off uh, point, um, going about it in a cost effective way for those housing providers who don't have the budgets of say Coca-Cola to get to a million different languages. I mean, you said there's 90 languages just in Idaho. So starting out to make it feel a little bit less daunting, um, do you have a little bit of advice there? Well, I do. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Rob. Well, when I was with the Housing Authority several years ago, when it first came out, we did not have a lot of funding. So how was I gonna to put together these materials in a language that I didn't have money to pay for interpretation, translation, et cetera. One of the things I did was reach out to different organizations across the community. There may have been groups, language groups. There might've been, for example, one of the local universities might've had interns in language programs, or you can go to people that are proactively serving communities of a different language, and they might be your collaborators in helping to put together materials like this. So I always encourage people, you know, if you can think about it from the perspective that it's already out there, applications, uh, you know, if you ask someone your name and address and telephone number in Spanish on a rental application, it's the same as a job application on the same as another application. So there are plenty of documents out there that you can start with to get basic information Combine that with people who may be able to partner with you. Uh, one of the things I saw King County in Seattle do one time was truly the Department of Labor there sent out a survey to all their employees across their department and said, do you speak another language? And they were able to identify a whole host of internal uh, qualified folks to help them provide services that they were unaware of. So if you're prepared to do a little legwork, find some help, do some research. The websites that are now available as opposed to 15, 20 years ago when we were starting this, um, there's a lot out there. But as Gary said, it starts with the plan. That's where you're going to put it all together. And then you fill in the pieces from there. Gary, anything else you'd like to add on that? The only thing that I would add, um, Rob, is that, uh, the document, document, document piece is document what you're doing, the attempts that you're making. I can tell you this, that HUD, at least from what I've seen in the uh, settlement agreements is pretty harsh in their evaluation of a housing provider's um, uh, plea of overburdensome, you know, that the requirement is overburdensome. Uh, you better have a very, very good justification for not providing uh, translation of documents. And the expectation on interpretation is that, uh, as near as I can tell, is that you will provide it or make sure it's provided some way. So there's not much wiggle room on interpretation. There's a little wiggle room on translation. So and we mentioned... Only thing is time over, it gives you time to do this and you should have a plan for, for translating what documents you're gonna translate first, what are your priority documents, what are the priority languages and what kind of progress you're making towards that. That's part of your needs assessment that you do when putting together your, your plan. Uh, and then we talked about the safe harbors, but I think it is important to note that with interpretation, that's a different issue. You have an obligation to provide services. Safe harbors are in reference to translated materials based on numbers. There's some formulas based on number of people and community, et cetera. And it's too difficult to say each community because each community has their own set of numbers. But the important thing is to go back to that piece that Gary referred to that shows what those safe harbors are and able to understand where you fit within that. Yeah. And just for anybody who isn't familiar, can you define what a safe harbor is really quick? Essentially what HUD says a safe harbor is, and this only applies to translation of vital documents, is that if you're operating within the safe harbor threshold 
and and you had a complaint and they came out and looked at your operation or they were doing a monitoring review of some kind if they determined that you're operating within safe harbor then you're compliant now it's not necessarily what we call best practice or the best customer service or something like that there are other considerations that you as a housing provider should make about how you want to meet your client. And that may mean that you do more, but if you I, wouldn't want to do less. <laughs> if I save harbor, that's sort of a, a term to say that, and this is very simplified, uh, but with interpretation of vital documents, if you have a certain X number of people in the community that speak that, that language, then you are obligated to provide that. If you do not have those numbers, then that's where they consider a safe harbor that you don't have an obligation to provide those uh, translation of documents. As Gary mentioned, none of us would say that's best practices or even good practices. Safe harbor shouldn't be something that someone uses to get out of doing something. Safe harbor is something that someone should say, okay, as we're having to determine which of these are more vital in terms of what documents we need to provide translation of, where is the need at in our community? The safe harbor says that these are the numbers that say, at this point, you probably are safer not doing them than with this other group who has higher numbers and you're gonna have a greater need, a greater likelihood of vital documents being interpreted or excuse me, translated, you have an obligation to do so. That's a very simple version, but yeah. that kind of covers what that means. Safe Harbor is just a number of people, whereas you have an obligation to provide those documents in language based on that number of demographic population. I think of it also, Rob, as um, if you have a complaint, the first thing that you, you you and your attorney as a housing provider are going to look for is refuge behind a safe harbor. But it's not very good in describing how you should operate your project. Yes. Okay. I have a question, another question. Should cities, counties, States, government entities provide LEP services for land use hearings, decisions, programs, notices, sewer and water services. And I'm gonna build off that question a little bit because I have a sneaking suspicion what your answer is gonna be based on mm -hmm. this entire program. Um, what would that look like? What, what do you envision for um, increased language access and um, services, LEP services in those areas, how they relate to land use and housing? Well, I think that's a really important connection uh, that uh, the questioner is making. Um, I think it bears very broadly on fair housing and housing equity and housing justice and a lot of, a lot of things that we talk about. Um, besides language access, but language access would be part of that. I think of a public entity, and I cannot think of a public entity in the state of Idaho that does not receive federal money of some kind. And along with that federal money comes this Title VI obligation. So every little town, county, no matter how remote, rural, and, and thinly populated it might be, they should be addressing language access. So that happens at the front counter when somebody comes into the office. That also happens in the um, formal hearings and, and uh, sessions that are called by these bodies. Um, they should be leaning into this and, and not considering it like an afterthought. Um, I bet you could go around the state and probably find a handful of local governments that their, their frontline staff have access to the language, uh, language line or a tele, another telephonic uh, language interpretation vendor. That's something that everybody can have. And if they don't use it, it doesn't cost them anything. But if somebody comes in speaking Tagalog, they can help them. 
And, and I think that's a really important thing. The other part of that is I'm thinking about public hearings and so forth. You're in Boise, you're given a time limit to testify. You may have three minutes or two minutes or whatever it is to say your piece. But if you're working through an in interpreter, your time is going to be at least doubled. I think, I think local governments ought to think about giving people in that speak other languages and are having to use an interpreter a little more time to express what it is that they have to say. There are probably other things. Um, certainly the public notices for those meetings, they ought to consider who lives in their community and what languages these public notices are put in. I can see on the local government standpoint that they would, uh, it would be helpful for them to know when somebody is going to show up at a public hearing, um, know beforehand when somebody's going to speak up, uh, need language assistance at a public hearing. But on the other hand, if they have language line, I can get language line on my cell phone and I can do that right there with that person and the interpreter on. So there, there should be no, it shouldn't be a barrier, but I think um, local governments through tradition or past practices or whatever, they sometimes create a barrier around it. For me, it's fundamental. We're talking about housing and land use is the precursor to potential housing. So to have access to what's happening with affordable housing, land use, potential development by the people of the community, regardless of what their language is, that's a fundamental piece for me. So I do believe that those services should be available. And but again, I come from the other perspective of not do you have to provide them, should you have to provide them, but you get to provide them. You get additional input. You get additional information from the community you hope to be hearing from when you reach out to communities that speak something other than just English, that in fact do live and use those lang those, that land in that community. So for me, I believe it's something that should be done but as Gary's identified, probably is it less done than we would like. Okay. Um, you've done a really great job of illustrating the many reasons to provide LEP services and increase language access for tenants. Can you give a little anecdote about a time that a language related service had an additional positive impact that you hadn't expected or anticipated, just that it sort of surprised you the difference that it made? Hmm. Um, yeah, boy, there's so many, but Gary, maybe you, if not, I have a funny story that I would be happy to share. When I started this work, so I'm gonna respond broadly to this. Um, I don't know that I probably, if I thought about it would have a specific story, but thinking more broadly about it, when I started this work, um, I kind of was thinking about it. Somebody needed something, housing providers. I'd been asked to do it by housing providers. And, and one housing provider suggested I turn it into a business. So I go, okay, it's a business. I have to say that when I started that I probably didn't fully realize the, the implications, the how deep this language access goes into everything a, a city, county, state government should be doing, how deep it goes into people's lives and the impact on their lives, whether it's they're receiving emergency rental assistance or they're dealing with a lease violation or they're trying to apply and get their foot in the door and find to get housing. Uh, it's it's uh, kind of profound in a way, uh, it, language access impact on um, everything that, that we do or should be doing in our communities and um, among our, especially our assisted housing providers. I have, there's one incident that I would like to illustrate because it identifies just do your best, do make your best mm -hmm. attempt. Gary talked about that document, show what you can do show what you have done, show what you're hoping to do, what you've put together. 
we had a circumstance uh, that taught me that you may not always get it right, no matter your best effort. We had a family, a Bantu family, and we had to resolve an issue with uh, something in their apartment. And when we brought them in for the meeting, they asked us why we didn't bring the elders in. So we took that to heart and, you know, cultural context is really important when it comes to interpreting as well. The next time we had an issue with a Bantu family, we brought the elders in and the family said, why did you bring the elders in? <laughs> so it just goes to show that do your best. You're maybe not always going to get it right every time, but that's what I've seen that they're going to be looking for is what, if you have a complaint file, what did you do? What were you trying to do? What were your best efforts? Where did you go wrong? Perhaps, but all of that is better than doing nothing. And that's what we see too many people do. They just say, well, this is not my thing. I'm good at doing housing, providing housing. I don't know anything about this. And they sort of put it on a back burner. And that's where that could lead to problems for them in terms of potential violations. But more importantly, from our perspective, that's where it could lead to problems for them because they're now not reaching someone that they could and should be reaching. You know, often uh, just a corollary to that, uh, Rob talked of in, uh, mentioned documenting what you're doing or trying to do, even if you don't do it right, at least you're trying. I think that goes a long way with HUD. Um, otherwise, it looks, if, if they don't have evidence to the contrary, it looks like you're actually putting up a barrier instead of trying to open a door. And um, so, Anyway, the documentation of your attempts to do it right are as important as tr doing it right. Can you actually speak a little bit more to that? That's I think that's a pretty important a pretty important point, Gary. Well, if you're a housing provider, uh, an assisted housing provider, and you don't have a language assistance program, you've not trained your staff. The initial look at you is that you're 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 putting up barriers. You're disregarding what the law requires in terms of meaningful access. Uh, if you can document that you got an interpreter and it was timely and that uh, the interpretation was competent and it was, you didn't charge them, you can go well. Yeah, I didn't have that plan, but I did the right thing. Um, that would probably be a pretty extreme example, but I think there's a lot more nuance to that, that if um, uh, I were a housing provider and I was talking with my attorney, my attorney would be looking for those kinds of things to put up as defenses. And if those uh, defenses aren't there, um, we saw the kind of penalties that can be levied against a housing provider. They can be, they can be painful. One of the words that I heard used by a HUD investigator was, we look at the climate. What's the climate? And that's pretty important. If the climate is you've done nothing, then as Gary said, that could be seen as an impediment. If the climate is, hey, these guys are doing the best they can, they have limited budget, but they've reached out here and there and they've got this in place and they're working on this. And, and it's while you, may not be 100% where you should be, you're doing your best effort. That does go a long way from what I've been led to understand from more than one HUD employee. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think we may actually wrap up a little bit early unless there are more questions. If so, please put them in the chat. I'm gonna give a little bit of information while we kind of hang out wait for some more questions. Um, thank you all for joining us for the second training in our series on fundamental transformations of land use policies and practices. Please be sure to check out our event page for the resources that were shared throughout today's webinar and the rest of the series. Please join us for our next meeting on Thursday, December 16th for part two of the basics of fair housing. Also, IFHC is looking for testers and we'll be scheduling our tester trainings for January very soon. Testers are paid for their time and work is remote. And currently we're looking for white males in their mid thirties or any gender of persons from India or Sri Lanka. Truly <laughs> really do need people from all backgrounds and classes. 
um, to help us test for fair housing violations. If this is something that you're interested in, reach out to us at contact at ifhcidaho.org or visit any of our social media pages. Thank you so much for being here, Gary, Rob, and Zoe for doing our intro. Thank you to our captioners and our LS ASL interpret interpreters and to Brittany O'Mara for running tech. The Intermountain Fair Housing Council is committed to providing universal access to all our events. Please contact us to request disability or interpretation accommodations. Advance notice is helpful for some accessibility needs and we're happy to provide interpretation for any language access access needs. If you are an attorney or architect, please email Zoanne Olson at Z-O-L-S-O-N at ifhcidaho.org with your bar number or AIA number for CLE or AIA credit. And doesn't look like we have any more questions. So well, this is a real privilege. I, I, I'm thankful we had an opportunity to do this. I wish everybody happy holidays. And thank you, Sarah and Brittany for the technical support and to our wonderful interpreters, thank you for your help. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks so much everybody for being here. We appreciate you.